topic, Chinese women, from the book Relations of Rescue. So the question here for the do now is simply to look at the uh, experience of Chinese immigration to the United States and determine what it will be like for Chinese women, which is what this screencast primarily is about. Just to recap where we have been so far with the information, you know, we have already looked at Abigail Adams, the Slave Convention, Seneca Falls. What I want to point out here is that in the early 1800s, this time frame right here is where the four virtues are really starting to become the norm in the society. And that is also the time when Chinese migration comes to the United States. Why? Primarily to build this railroad. The Transcontinental Railroad is a railroad that is going to link the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean or the East Coast to the West Coast. Who is going to build this? That's where the Chinese labor comes in. The Chinese are going to be recruited. Migration is going to be encouraged and they will come to work for low wages, as we see right here, being paid $27 in comparison to 35 for people from Ireland. So they are going to be the primary laborers for the Transcontinental Railroad. And at the end of the railroad completion, uh, these individuals are going to be encouraged to go back. Just to point out, the West does have a history of uh, extending voting to women. Uh, we look at this particular map here, you see full suffrage on the West Coast, no suffrage down here on the East Coast. And that's because the West historically has been trying to encourage women to develop this particular area. Uh, and the, the railroad is also going to assist with that particular uh, goal. Uh, anyway, uh, feel free to conduct the search for women, uh, voting rights, and the West, and uh, see what comes up. So migration to the West, uh, 1849, we're going to start building this transcontinental railroad, and things get heated up. Uh, for example, looking at the headline for this article, a San Francisco mayor wants the Exclusion Act to bar the Japs. He is referring to the Japanese. The fact that a politician would have an article with such a title is definitely a uh, issue of concern, but definitely something that is allowed for this uh, 1800 climate. Uh, bar civilization let down on the western borderland, heathen Chinese, so he's calling the Chinese heathens. Um, again, this is a mayor that's saying this, and you know, this is going to uh, look at the difference between the Chinese and Japanese, and according to the article, um, he is concerned that the Japanese labor, you know, as he says here, is enlightened, and this being true, his education prompts him to adopt American ways and cheap labor dig at the foundation. So his main argument is that the Chinese throughout this article will work for a low wage, whereas the Japanese wants to actually be in a position where they can own farms and own businesses, which is why he wants the Exclusion Act to bar them, which tells me the Exclusion Act already includes the Chinese. Here we have a series of laws that are being passed in the state of California to target the uh, Chinese labor. 1854. Uh, so 1850s, you start to see the um, migration begin, and now we see some of the laws trying to impact uh, what they can and cannot do. For example, in People versus Hall, Chinese are not legally white. So what exactly are they? I don't know, but if uh, Blumenbach had his way, I guess Blumenbach would say they are yellow, because Blumenbach is the guy who comes up with the concept of race as a color. 1858, Chinese uh, bar immigration and other Mongolians. So here they use Chinese and Mongolians. I know that this phrase right here has been used by 1800 politicians to include the Chinese. So I'm curious as to why they would mix the two up, because I would suggest that the Chinese would be part of the Mongolian race if Mongolian is a race. Don't know what to say there. Um, anyway. They prohibit non-whites from owning land, and here this miscegenation law prohibits marriage between whites and Mongolians. So here, they didn't even address the Chinese, so I guess here it would be allowed, unless we're going to say that the Chinese are part of the Mongolian race. I don't know, but here we have some other groups that are being uh, impacted by the miscegenation laws. Uh, ineligible for citizenship from buying land, and it's not until 1948 that these uh, miscegenation laws are labeled unconstitutional. So this part right here, prohibiting those uh, from buying land, um, you know, that is an interesting dynamic. But what I would say is a result of all of these laws and the treatment, um, you know, the hostility, that is going to lead to a situation where the Chinese are going to band together and create local small communities, which is why you see, you know, Chinatowns, uh, you know, Los Angeles, New York City, 
You know, it's a result of the hostility that the group encountered that forces the group to kind of go into defensive mode. So in class, you were asked to uh, look at the uh, readings here. And the reading, uh, one of them addressed the PAGE Act, uh, which looks at the transportation of people, uh, primarily from China, Japan, or any Oriental country, uh, without their free and voluntary consent. The fact that this is 1875, that's interesting because what about the ones that were here before 1875? And take a look at section three, the importation to the U.S. of women for the purpose of prostitution is forbidden, which tells me before 1875, was that practice allowed? I would suggest yes. How did the 1800 experience between Chinese women and African American female slaves differ? That's just a discussion question, and really the the difference would be, um, you know, with regard to how the group comes here and you know what that group's experience is like, which is primarily the point of the readings. Uh, the readings look at something called the Chinese Mission Home, and the Chinese Mission Home, which is going to be used as a force to try to assimilate and control the Chinese uh, female as she arrives in America. So according to the reading, uh, you come to find out that the Chinese mission home is providing refuge for the Chinese prostitutes. Okay, so these Presbyterian women have created this Chinese mission home to uh, provide a safety net for these Chinese prostitutes. Why would they do that? I don't know. All right, so let's see. Uh, the abuse of women that flourish in Western cities, to build a rescue home to provide shelter and protection for those Chinese women who are as prostitutes. So you come to find out that the laborers that are coming over here, these individuals, um, you start to see, uh, you know, Chinese women coming up as well, and these individuals are playing the role of prostitutes. So we have two labor exchanges. We have one labor that is the Chinese male to build the railroad, and if you haven't figured it out, the Chinese female is being, you know, sent to the United States for yet the fulfillment of another, you know, labor of a different type. All right, the reading goes on to suggest, um, let's see, Chinese immigrants overrun American institutions, but unlike them, they oppose Chinese exclusion laws. The use of Chinese women as prostitutes is a visible threat to female purity. Remember the four virtues. So the question here is, what does uh, the four virtues have in, in common? How is it going to impact these Chinese women that are coming as prostitutes? Are they following the four virtues? And if they are not following the four virtues, that is where these Presbyterian women are getting the idea. Their argument is they're not fulfilling these four virtues, so we are going to create these mission homes as a way to try to assimilate these Chinese women. Keep in mind, they're not saying anything about the purity of the male population that is trying to attract these women to come over as prostitutes. According to the reading, there is a double standard, and women are challenging the double standard. What are they challenging? Well, they're looking at men. Why is it fair for men to violate the idea of purity, yet females are being held to this strict code? Um, you know, that seems to be where this is going, uh, which made me look up the purity campaign, and the purity campaign is an 1800 attempt to try to hold men accountable to the same ideas of purity that women are being um, held to in the 1800s. If you did not know, the purity campaign also has a connection to the temperance movement, and the temperance movement, when you combine purity and temperance, would play a role in the creation of prohibition. So these things are linked, and they all are about the behavior. And so uh, what point are these movements about controlling men? Uh, that seems to be uh, the question here, but the problem is who owns and controls the institutions? the laws, the courts, so women are going to have a difficult time, which is probably the reason why they are going to try to just deal with the Chinese women in a different way. In this particular image, you know, you have this woman here, who possibly is a Chinese prostitute, and this Presbyterian woman is trying to impose her image of purity and the four virtues on her. So that's the history for the Chinese women. Come to find out that they were asked to come to the United States, um, to fulfill a labor need, um, you know, and it brings up a couple of questions. You know, what's the Presbyterian woman motive, um, you know, for, for doing this? Are they looking out for the Chinese women or are they looking out for the, the four virtues or are they really concerned about their men and the uh, lustful decisions that these men are making to engage in sexual acts 
with the Chinese prostitutes. That's it.